Batak massacre refers to the massacre of Bulgarians in Batak by Ottoman irregular troops in 1876 at the beginning of the April Uprising. The number of victims ranges from 1,200 to 7,000, depending on the source. Uprising in Batak the role of Batak in the April Uprising was to take possession of the storehouses in the surrounding villages and to ensure that the insurgents would have provisions, also to block the main ways and keep the Turkish soldiers from receiving supplies. The task of Batak was to manage with the Pomak villagers should those try to prevent the uprising. Should the Chetis in the nearby locations fail in the commands, the rest should have gathered in Batak. The only problem the organization of the uprising had expected was that Batak had to defend itself alone against the Turkish troops, but the risk was taken. After the April uprising started on 30 April 1876, part of the armed men in Batak, led by the voivode Peter Goronov, attacked the Turks. They succeeded to eliminate part of the Ottoman leaders but were reported to the authorities and 5,000 Bashi Bizuk were sent, mainly Pomics, led by Ahmet Aga from Barutan which surrounded the town. At that time the Pomics were a part of the Ottoman Muslim millet. After a first battle, the men from Batak decided to negotiate with Ahmet Aga. He promised him the withdrawal of his troops under the condition that Batak disarmed. After the rebels had laid down their weapons, the Bashi Bizuk attacked them and beheaded them. Massacre While some of the leaders of the Revolutionary Committee were surrendering the weapons, some managed to escape the village. But immediately after that all the territory was surrounded and no one else was let out. The Bashi Bozuk went to the houses and raided him. Many were burnt and they shot at everyone and everything. Many of the people decided to hide into the houses of the wealthy or in the church, which had a stronger construction and was going to protect them from the fire. On the 2nd of May, those hidden in the house of Bogdan surrendered because they were promised by Ahmet Aga to be spared. More than 200 men, women and children were led out, stripped out of their valuables and clothes, in order not to stain them with their blood, and were brutally killed. The Uga asked some of the wealthy men of Batak to go to his camp and lay down all the arms of the villagers. Amongst him was the mayor Trendafil Tosh of Karilov and his son, Peter Trendafil of Karilov. They had reached an agreement that if the village was disarmed, the Pomex will leave Batak for good. But instead, the Bulgarians were caught captive. Once the arms were confiscated, all of them were beheaded, burnt alive or impaled. The murder of the leader Trendafil Karilov was particularly violent and was described by a witness, his son's wife Bosilka. My father-in-law went to meet the Bashi Bizuk where the village was surrounded by the men of Ahmet Aga, who said that he wanted all the arms laid down. Trendafil went to collect them from the villages. When he surrendered the arms, they shot him with a gun and the bullets scratched his eye. Then I heard Ahmet Aga command with his own mouth for Trendafil to be impaled and burnt. The words he used were, Shisha K.O.R., which is Turkish for, to put on a skewer. After that, they took all the money he had, undressed him, gouged his eyes, pulled out his teeth and impaled him slowly on a stake, until it came out of his mouth. Then they roasted him while he was still alive. He lived for half an hour during this terrible scene. At the time, I was near Ahmet Aga with other Bulgarian women. We were surrounded by Bashi Bozuk, who had us surrounded, and forced us to watch what was happening to Trendafil. One of her children, Vladimir, who was still a baby at his mother's breast, was impaled on a sword in front of her eyes. At the time this was happening, Ahmet Aga's son took my child from my back and cut him to pieces, there in front of me. The burnt bones of Trendafil stood there for one month and only then they were buried. Januarius McGahan, a journalist of the New York Herald and the London Daily News wrote of the terrible happenings after his visitation to Batak with Eugene Schuyler. 
They described the burned and destroyed city with the stench of the rotting of thousands of pile dismembered corpses and skeletons of the innocent, victims including young women, children and unborn babies torn out from the wombs of their pregnant mothers. Church The Orthodox Church, Sveta Nedelya, was the last keep of the rebels. Bashi Bizuk destroyed the school, where 200 people were burnt alive, hidden in the basement. Then they went straight to the church, where they dug holes into the fence of the yard and started to shoot at everyone there. The most terrifying chapter of the massacre happened on the night of 2 May 1876 in that very yard. On the morning of 3 May the Pomix took the yard and advanced to the door of the church, but weren't able to get in. The door was barred by the people inside. The defense of the church held for three days, the Turkish were shooting ceaselessly at the villagers to make them surrender. Some tried to enter the church from the roof, but were unsuccessful, although they were able to shoot some of the people inside. There was no water in the church, so the barricaded had to resort to the oil of the lamps and the blood of their own dead. They tried to dig into the floor with bare hands in order to find underground water. On the third day the survivors decided to go outside, when they realized their fate was decided. When they opened the doors of the church our Metagia was waiting for them with his bashi, Bozuk. A ruthless beheading followed and only those who accepted to be converted to Islam were spared. The plans of the Ottoman leader were to populate the village with the converted villagers, but it turned out that there were not enough of them. Before the Bashi Bozuk left the village, they burnt the church. But the stone walls were preserved and only the wooden furniture and the icons were destroyed. When some Russian commissions were to go and inspect the village, three months later, the Ottoman authorities tried to bury the bodies but they could not hide the smell in the air. They also painted the walls of the church but the blood stains showed up in time. After the massacre in the church, Ahmet Targa summoned all the surviving villagers outside, saying that it would be in order to make a list of the slain and the widows. The better part of the survivors gathered, since those who did not obey would be killed. They were divided in two groups of women and men, then the Ottoman commander made the women stand back and slew all the remaining 300 men. Those women who protested were also raped and killed. On the same day there were another 300 people murdered on the wooden bridge beside the school. First their arms were cut off, then their ears, noses shoulders, and only after that they were finished. Attack after the massacre. According to the most sources, around 5,000 people were massacred in Batak alone. The total number of victims in the April uprising according to most estimates around 15,000, which is supported by Eugene Schuyler's report, published in Daily News according to which at least 15,000 persons were killed during the April uprising in addition to 36 villages in three districts being buried. According to Donald Quattet around 1,000 Muslims were killed by Christian Bulgarians and consequently 3,700 Christians were killed by Muslims. A contemporary British report mentioned that only 46 Muslim men and no women and children were killed. In his work, The Bulgarian Massacres Reconsidered, which has been described as pro-Turkish, the American historian Richard Milliman states that Schuyler visited personally only 11 of the villages he reported on. Milliman also claims that the accepted reality of the massacres is largely a myth. Schuyler described the things he saw. On every side were human bones, skulls, ribs, and even complete skeletons, heads of girls still adorned with braids of long hair, bones of children, skeletons still encased in clothing. Here was a house the floor of which was white with the ashes and charred bones of thirty persons burned alive there. Here was the spot where the village notable Trendafil was spitted on a pike and then roasted and where he is now buried, there was a foul hole full of decomposing bodies, here a mill dam filled with swollen corpses, here the schoolhouse, 
where 200 women and children had taken refuge there were burned alive, and here the church and churchyard, where fully a thousand half-decayed forms were still to be seen, filling the enclosure in a heap several feet high, arms, feet, and heads protruding from the stones which had vainly been thrown there to hide them, and poisoning all the air. Since my visit, by orders of the Muta Serif, the Kaimakam of Tartabizajik was sent to Batak, with some lime to aid in the decomposition of the bodies, and to prevent a pestilence. Ahmed Daga, who commanded at the massacre, has been decorated and promoted to the rank of Yuzbashi. Another witness to the aftermath of the massacre is American journalist Januarius McGahan, who described what he saw as follows. There was not a roof left, not a whole wall standing, all was a mass of ruins. We looked again at the heap of skulls and skeletons before us, and we observed that they were all small and that the articles of clothing intermingled with them and lying about were all women's apparel. These, then, were all women and girls. From my saddle I counted about a hundred skulls, not including those that were hidden beneath the others in the ghastly heap nor those that were scattered far and wide through the fields. The skulls were nearly all separated from the rest of the bones, the skeletons were nearly all headless. These women had all been beheaded, dot and the procedure seems to have been, as follows. They would seize a woman, strip her carefully to her chemise, laying aside articles of clothing that were valuable, with any ornaments and jewels she might have about her. Then as many of them as cared would violate her, and the last man would kill her or not as the humor took him. We looked into the church which had been blackened by the burning of the woodwork but not destroyed, nor even much injured. It was a low building with a low roof, supported by heavy irregular arches, that as we looked in seemed scarcely high enough for a tall man to stand under. What we saw there was too frightful for more than a hasty glance. An immense number of bodies had been partially burnt there and the charred and blackened remains seemed to fill it halfway up to the low dark arches and make them lower and darker still, were lying in a state of putrefaction too frightful to look upon. I had never imagined anything so horrible. We all turned away sick and faint, and staggered out of the fearful pest house glad to get into the street again. We walked about the place and saw the same thing repeated over and over a hundred times. Skeletons of men with the clothing and flesh still hanging to and rotting together, skulls of women, with the hair dragging in the dust, bones of children and infants everywhere. Here they show us a house where twenty people were burned alive, there another where a dozen girls had taken refuge, and been slaughtered to the last one, as their bones amply testified. Everywhere horrors upon horrors, the British Commissioner, Mr. Baring describes the event as perhaps the most heinous crime that has stained the history of the present century. In October Mr. Baring had to report again on the proceedings of the Turkish Commission. After six weeks from the closing of the committee it had not been decided whether or not the Batak massacre was a crime. Accusations of revisionism In May 2007, a public conference was scheduled in Bulgaria by Martina Baleva and Ulf Brunbauer aiming to present research in an effort to form the official report of the events of the Batak massacre. Bulgarian media reported that the authors were denying the massacre, which gave rise to a substantial media controversy. On 3 April 2011, Batak massacre victims were canonized as saints, something that had not happened for more than a century.